<clears throat> Hello. Can you hear me? Can you? You can? Okay. It's bad when nobody responds. <laughs> um, bad sign. So <coughs> we're going to be in Matthew 13, and we're kind of all over the place. Um, but I just want you to listen to these words and to receive them by faith. Let them be water, rain on your heart. Take them in in faith. And at the end, I'm going to say, I'm going to declare this is the word of the Lord, and you can respond with a heart of gratitude. Thanks be to God. Okay? All right, so Matthew 13, <clears throat> starting in verse 24. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How, then, does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest and at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Down to verse 36. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. And down to 45, or no, sorry, 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to our church. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful to you that we can be gathered here as a church today to look at your word to take it in our hearts. Let it go deep in our hearts. Let it bear fruit that is pleasing to you, that is to your glory. 
that is delightful in your eyes, let it bear fruit in us. Let this church be changed today by the power of your word and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Let anything that would keep us from receiving from you be cast out of us. Let every distraction be put away. Let our hearts be tilled so that they are tilled soil, ready to receive your seed, ready to receive the reign of righteousness. Your prophet Hosea said, break up the fallowed ground, seek the Lord, and wait for the reign of righteousness. Lord, we're here, ready, waiting. I pray for every heart here that you would purify us purify our church remove any leaven but Lord we know that there will be tares that will grow with the kingdom until the end and so Lord I say I ask you to preserve us and preserve our fruitfulness let us bear much fruit in spite of the scheming of the enemy in spite of Satan's tactics let this church bear an abundant harvest to your glory Lord be with us in your spirit. Let us receive from you freely, Lord. I pray it all in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so we've been learning so much about this kingdom, the kingdom of God. And it's also called the kingdom of heaven. This kingdom that God rules it is no longer restricted to the confines or the boundaries of heaven. It is breaking out on earth. Can you imagine the dominion of King Jesus is no longer being restrained to heaven, but is breaking out among us? Yes, there's one person excited about it. She's just went on vacation, so she's a little bit fresh, you know? She's excited. So... Well, we, we've been learning so much about the kingdom of heaven. Last week we were learning about, um, well, the week before we were learning about how we can have different kinds of soil that responds to the kingdom of heaven, that responds to the word of God. There's some soil that's hard. There's some soil that will not receive the seed. There's some that will receive the seed in joy, but it will be burned out by persecution and tribulation. It will lose all fruitfulness. There are some that will be choked out by the concerns of this world, losing all fruitfulness. And we have something similar here today. Last week, we learned about why Jesus is speaking in parables. He's speaking to us in stories. And ultimately, a big reason for that is because people don't even have the ears to hear. They don't want to listen. They're not listening to Jesus. And so he's saying, you will hear if you are truly called by my Father. And so I'm going to give it to you in a story. I'm going to give it to you in story. So listen close. He who has ears, let him hear. Oh, Lord, give us ears here, right? Let us have ears. We can be so easily self-deceived to think we have ears. and be so wrong. So many people have gone throughout history thinking that they were wheat, sons of the kingdom, but were tares in the kingdom. They had no ears to hear, no heart to truly receive the seed of God. So we're learning a lot about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and that phrase in the Greek, it's kind of po both active and passive. It doesn't just suffer violence, it is also coming violently is what he says. And I kind of like how we, that interpretation of it because that's really what we're seeing in a lot of the things Jesus is saying. It's coming with violence. It's suffering violence as well. The enemy is planting tares, but it's coming violently. It's coming to destroy every spiritual authority, to cast them down, and put King Jesus on his rightful throne. Amen? And so Jesus says, he says, where, this is where the kingdom of heaven is established. He said in the last chapter, in Matthew 12, he said, after he had just cast out a demon out of a person, he said, he showed them what this really signified. What was the true meaning of him casting out this demon? He said it in verse 28. 
if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Where the power of the Holy Spirit, where the presence of the Holy Spirit is, there the kingdom of heaven is. Where the satanic stronghold has been destroyed and the dark spiritual authority has been cast down and Jesus put on the throne, his power and authority, his dominion felt, that's where the kingdom of heaven is. Is the kingdom of heaven in our hearts? Has it been established in us individually? Has it been established in our church? Has it been established in Burlington, in Vermont, on this planet? It's being established because it's coming violently. The strong man cannot resist the stronger man, Jesus. He will despoil the strong man. That's what he said in the next verse. How can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Jesus is plundering the kingdom of Satan by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's taking captives for himself. We are captives taken from Satan's stronghold, transferred out of the kingdom of darkness, and put into the kingdom of his beloved son, the kingdom of light. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So now that brings us to today's parable. Now one thing I want to uh, just point out is just what, what is the significance of this parable to the people listening to this? I mean, how many people have had your enemies plant weeds among your garden or your field? Anybody else here? Just me? Mitch? Mm, yeah. We have slugs. An army of slugs has come to decimate our garden. So I kind of think of that as a parable of the enemy coming to destroy our fruitfulness. So I fight those satanic slugs. Uh, burn them with salt, cleansing our, our garden, um, putting a platter of beer out to drown them. They love the beer, they come to it. I also love the beer, but I'm willing to sacrifice it for that. So, now, what we're seeing is, is um, what was I even talking about? Yes, the tares, weeds. So, tares, you're like, why are you talking about tares? This says weeds. The ESV says weeds. And that could be confusing because you just think of typical garden weeds. But really, he's talking about tares or darnel, which is a type of weed that looks exactly like wheat. It looks just like wheat. To the untrained eye, you can't even tell the difference. And so when does the difference come? They, they grow up together. They're looking the same. But here's where the difference comes, is around harvest time, the wheat will start to turn a golden brown, and it starts to lilt, start to, have you seen the pictures of wheat, or has it been running a field of wheat? It starts to lilt, and you can see the grains, the brown kernels, and that's really what it's planted for, right, is those kernels of grain. And the darnel, or the tares, it stays green, it stands up straight, has black seeds. And those seeds, if eaten, can be a little bit poisonous, cause nausea, vomiting. And so what would happen in this day and age, farming was everything, right? That's all you had, basically, was a farm. And so an enemy would come, and they would either salt your fields, the salt would go into the earth, and the salt basically sucks in the moisture, sucks it away from the wheat, the plant, so that it withers and dies, or they would plant tares. And the whole purpose was to compromise the fruit that they were to bear. And eventually, this, became, this was a pretty common enough practice to where Rome had to outlaw it. So, you think that somebody would have outlawed it before that, but so that's what we're dealing with here. That's what the people are understanding, that this is, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's like Jesus planting something and the enemy coming to compromise his fruitfulness. Now, let's look at the passage. Matthew 13. He says, The kingdom of heaven 
may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. And that little verse is so compact, so full of meaning. You know, um, there's a lot in that good seed. I, I think when I first approached this passage, I kind of thought of the last parable where the seed was the word, right, going out. But here, Jesus gives us the interpretation that says that the seed, he says it in verse 38, that the good seed that the Son of Man planted, Jesus planted, are the sons of the kingdom. The sons of the kingdom. The true children of the kingdom. Now, so Jesus, he's going about planting his kingdom, planting people, right? Planting true children of the kingdom. The enemy is coming, planting, what are the tares? False sons. Sons of the evil one. That is the difference here. Now, why is Jesus planting seeds? What is his purpose? What does he want? Why do you plant seeds in general? It's for, it's for the fruit. It's to have a yield. Now, you can see this desire of God to have fruit, to have a yield, to have a harvest from the beginning. I mean, can you think of Genesis 1? He says to Adam and Eve, what does he say? Be fruitful and multiply, right? Genesis 1, let's see if I can flip over through the preface. No, it's not inspired. And um, <clears throat> verse 28, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion dominion over every living thing in the earth. This was repeated in Genesis 9 when Noah was the last surviving, his family was the last surviving people after the flood. And God said, you be fruitful and multiply. Increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. The Lord is wanting fruit. He's wanting fruit by any means necessary. And what is, what is this fruit, though, right? What are, we, what are we talking about when we talk about fruit? Because he, we're not talking about him eating us, right? We're talking about something that he delights in, right? That's kind of one thing that we forget about food, you know, when we eat too much McDonald's, is that food is meant to be enjoyed for the glory of God. And so fruit is something that God delights in, cherishes it. He cherishes the fruit that we will yield when he plants us. There will be a yield of our lives. How much fruit am I going to bear? A little fruit? A lot of fruit? More fruit? Less fruit? That fruit will be to God's glory. It, it makes me think of what he's planting, really, uh, another analogy that kind of goes away from this one is that he's planting for himself or raising up a wife a wife for his son, a bride. That's the analogy that Paul uses in Ephesians chapter 5. He's talking to husbands. He says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, set her apart from the world for himself having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. That is what Jesus is craving when he's planting this seed is to have something that he can delight in. 
that he can present to himself in splendor, in beauty. It's the bride coming down the altar. When Jen and I got married, I did not think I was going to cry at my wedding. I don't know why I even cried, but I did, seeing her coming down, and I was thinking of this Jesus waiting for his bride, who he delights in, coming down the altar to himself. And the joy that he has, I'm presenting you to myself in splendor. Your fruit, the, the, the silks that she wears are called the righteous deeds of the saints in Revelation. So the fruit is people, but it's also all the things that we produce. That's more what it is, actually, is the righteous deeds that are performed. The righteousness that comes forth from a Holy Spirit invigorated life as the Holy Spirit produces good works in us and through us. Do you understand that? Does that make sense? That's what he wants, is fruit. That's what he wants, is to present himself this body in holiness and beauty and splendor. Now, one thing I, I notice about this seed, though, is that he himself is a seed. Jesus refers himself to as a seed in John 12. And that we are seeds. And what is a seed's purpose but to die? The seed's first purpose is to die. Do you realize that? A seed has to die first. It has to be buried in the ground before you can have any expectancy of life, of fruit. And so Jesus, he, he shows us the way by being the first seed and by being the first fruits. And Jesus says, before, right before he's really getting into this, the last hour, as he's entering the final hour, he says in John 12, 23, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. Do you hear that? It has to fall to the earth. It has to die. Otherwise, it will be alone. If, are you feeling a little alone? <laughs> are you feeling a little alone where you are? Well, maybe you have to die <laughs> to self because that's what's going to produce fruit. That's when it, what's going to produce an abundant harvest. But if it dies, if it dies, it bears much fruit. This is the kingdom principle that to bring fruit, you must have death. And Jesus shows us this at the cross. He goes to the cross, dies, is buried in the earth, and I'll get to the next part of what he does next, but I think you know. But he says before he goes on this path to the cross, he says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, or wait, I'm I, I went behind. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Do you, do you get what he's saying there? Maybe you don't get it. He's saying, follow me. I'm going down the road to death. I'm going to the cross. And I'm telling you to pick up your cross and to follow me. Does that sound familiar? Pick up your cross and follow me. Come with me. I am the first seed. I am going into the earth to die, and I want you to come with me, and there will be an abundant harvest in the kingdom. Do you believe it? Yes. That's the truth. Turn your hearts to this way that Christ has set us up for. Do you guys need to like shake up your arms or something? I don't know. There's a little bit of sleepiness in the crowd. Wake up! So... <laughs> And Jesus says, now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. 
save me from this death? No. For this purpose I have come to this hour. That is the purpose why I came. And what, did it, what is it going to yield? 1 Corinthians 16. It yields a beautiful, abundant harvest. And Jesus is the first fruits of this harvest. He is wraith ripe. Have you ever heard that? The wraith ripe fruits. It's kind of a literary term. It means the first fruits, okay? It's just another way of saying it. But in fact, Christ has been raised, 1 Corinthians 16, 20. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man, Adam, came death, by a man, Jesus, has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. If I am crucified with Christ, then I will be raised with Christ. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. The end of the age that we've been hearing about here in Matthew 13. The end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. After destroying every rule and every authority and every power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. So do you get that? Does that make sense? You fall on tracking? So this is the path that the Lord has set up for us. And he's asking us to carry his death in our bodies also. That's your application for the day carry about the death of Christ in you. You ever heard anybody say that to you? I haven't heard that too many preachers say that. Um, I don't know why, but um, I never heard it much growing up. But this is, <clears throat> this is the ministry that the apostles bore in their bodies, in their mortal flesh, was the death of Christ. And you see it in 2 Corinthians 4. Paul talks about it there in verse 7 and onward. He says, we have this treasure, all this treasure, in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Do you want the resurrection power of Christ in your life? Do you crave that? Are you willing to give up everything like Paul in Philippians chapter 3, he says, I counted everything as lost so that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Do you want to know the power of his resurrection? Well, you have to know his suffering and his death. You have to be a seed because he says to know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Philippians 3, 7 through 11, read it to be conformed to his death. If you want to be conformed to his life, you must be conformed to his death. A lot of American Christianity talks so much about Easter and about being conformed to the resurrection power of Christ, but we forget that to get to the empty tomb, you must go through the portal of the cross. You must go through the cross. So Paul was glad to boast and say, always carrying in our body the death of Jesus. Every affliction, every time we're perplexed, every time we're persecuted, hated by the world for our faith, every difficulty, every weakness. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. Given over by whom? By the Father. He gives his, just as Jesus, as a seed plants, he gives over the seeds to the grave. 
Do you see that? He gives the seeds to the grave. Precious are the, is the death of his saints, but he gives the seeds to the grave be in hope for the fruit that they will bear. We who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So, death is at work in us, but life in you. That's the next verse. I just read it in my head. Death is at work. He's saying death is at work in us, the apostles in our ministry, for your sake, Corinthians, for your sake. We die to ourselves so that you may have life and fruit. I suffer everything for the sake of the elect, said Paul in one of the Timothys, I don't remember. In Colossians 1, Paul said, it's amazing, the self-sacrificing love of Paul. We say the self-sacrificing love of Christ, but Paul is a member of his body, as are we. I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, says Paul in Colossians 1.24. I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body. That is the church. That we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. This is a little bit of a different sermon. I don't know if you can tell. Um, <clears throat> so I think we've talked about that first verse enough, right? But we're learning this thing about the kingdom of heaven. You've got to see this. You've got to see the beauty of the wheat and the harvest that the Lord wants to see the incredible disgustingness of this enemy Satan who wants to come in and compromise the harvest of the Lord, the very thing for which he created this universe and this world, for fruit, for multiplication, for his image to be reflected in us and to multiply and fill the universe. It's disgusting what Satan is doing. So what is he doing? Well, <clears throat> It says in our passage that he's planting tares. He sowed weeds. And these are the sons of the evil one, according to verse 38. So the first thing that we kind of see from that, that I want you to see, I don't want you to miss this, is that the kingdom of heaven, and I don't mean the authentic, true kingdom of heaven. I mean the visible kingdom of heaven. I mean the visible church. All the members of the church. The people who show up for group. The people who show up for the meals. It's a mixed group. It's a mixed body. Notice that he's saying that in the harvest time, at the end of the age, he is going to be gathering them out of the kingdom. Not out of the world. Gathering the weeds and the tares out of the kingdom. Do you get it? That was in verse 41 where he says that. So there are people among us, maybe even us, right, who are tares, plants of the enemy, sons of the evil one. The church is a mixed body, you don't get comfort from just attendance. Attendance is not a sign that you are a true son of the kingdom. Just because you go to church and do all the things that church people do, that does not mean that you're enrolled in the book of life. First Timothy 5 says something similar. Paul, if I can find it, uh, 1 Timothy 5, <clears throat> Paul warns Timothy, who is governing over churches. He warns them in 1 first, in first Timothy 5, verse 24, the sins of some people are conspicuous, right? Conspicuous. 
They're pretty evident. You see it, and we all know it, or some of us at least. Going before them to judgment, even before the day of judgment, it goes before them. But the sins of others appear later. The sins of others will appear later. And when will it truly appear? But at the harvest time, at the end of the age, when he draws all people to himself, and he draws the people who call themselves the Christians, and he weeds out those who are not. Do you get the picture? This isn't just the whole, this isn't the whole world. This is the people who call themselves the kingdom. So, Satan is putting his sons as plants to compromise God's harvest. And I kind of want to explore a little bit of what that looks like. Because, you know, we just talked about some of them are conspicuous. I think Jesus is talking about the inconspicuous more here, and I'll explain that later. But some of them are conspicuous. Some tares are pretty evident, some weeds, and we know to root them out pretty quickly. Well, Jesus gave us a warning that in these last times, in these ends of these days, which we are in, we're in the last time, the last days, that there will be these weeds, and there will be different kinds. There will be false prophets, false teachers, people whose hearts are cold to the truth of the gospel. It says in Matthew 24, speaking of the end of the age, in verse 10, and then many will fall away many will fall away. That's speaking about from the people who call themselves the people of God. Many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. This is what Jesus says of our day. Many false prophets abound, do they not? Many churches, many denominations, many sects, many different kinds of of cults. But just New King is the right one, right? No, I'm kidding. No, just just to make that clear. Um, Just the Baptist. No, just kidding. All right, another of those. So, um... But it will become evident who the true sons of the kingdom are. But there are some who will make themselves very evident, conspicuous by teaching a false gospel. And the New Testament abounds with the apostles confronting head-on false teaching. And Galatians is one big example of this where Paul is confronting head-on this heresy of the Judaizer sect. The Judaizers were telling people, yeah, you have to believe in Jesus, but you also, more than that, have to follow the ordinances of the law. You have to be circumcised. You have to follow the festivals. You have to observe the Sabbath. So they were going beyond the new covenant law of the gospel, and Paul has strong words for these people. He says of them in Galatians 2.4 at a council meeting, he says, yet because of false brothers, he calls them false brothers, first of all, secretly brought in, secretly by whom, I wonder, perhaps by Satan planting sons of the evil one in the kingdom, yet because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery. This is the work of some tares, is to re-enslave and to destroy true sons of the kingdom. Paul has such strong words, he even says to them about these people in Galatians 5, basically that he wishes they would go all the way in their circumcision and just castrate themselves. That's how strong that we should think of false teaching. Now, that's a false gospel. There are many false gospels, many cults, but there are also other kinds of false teaching, such as teaching that sin is okay in the eyes of God. 
This abounds in America in some form or another. In one extreme, and I'll just talk about this extreme, is teaching that sexual immorality is actually all right. And there are many forms of this, but this is a common false teaching that springs up. We see it in Revelation 2, where Jesus is essentially telling a church that he's going to remove them. Well, I don't think he said that to this church. He said it to some other churches. But he's giving them a strong rebuke about this woman that he calls Jezebel, who is a false prophet, he calls her, and teaching sexual immorality. That's in Revelation 2, 19 through 23. He says, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. Their sin was a sin of tolerance. Who calls herself a prophet, a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Listen to the patience of the Lord and the forbearance of the Lord. I gave her time to repent. But she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. I will throw her onto a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. I will strike her children dead. I will destroy the fruit of her womb. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart. I will give to each of you according to your works. And sexual immorality, I point that one out because Paul actually says of sexual immorality in 1 Corinthians 6 that this is actually a worse sin. He says that the body was made for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And so the one who sins, not sinning in sexual immorality, sins outside their body, if that's not bad enough, but the one who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. That thing, this vessel that was made and intended to be a temple of the Lord, you are using in adultery, using for another. Do you understand that? 1 Corinthians 6, read it and weep it if you don't believe it, okay? So, <clears throat> that is that is an example, another example of false teaching that abounds today. You see it in every rainbow flag outside a church. Yeah, I'm going to go there. You see it in every rainbow flag that is outside a church. Calling sexual immorality righteousness. You see it in every church that allows adultery. Every church that says that it's all right to have sex outside of marriage. And they do exist. I know those Christians. Maybe you do too. That is a false teaching. What is our responsibility to such people? You know, Jesus, he said this. He said, when the angels, right, his servants asked him if they should gather and root up the tares, Jesus said, no, lest you root up the wheat. So, we might think, well, okay, is that how we're supposed to deal with false teachers is just to let them be? No, don't make that mistake. It's very clear throughout the New Testament that, that this is leaven that must be cleansed. It must be rooted out. Look at how Paul responded to those false teachers. Galatians 2, 5, the next verse after what I just mentioned. He says, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. He knew that the truth of the gospel would be perverted, that the gospel would be lost if they did not defend this, if they, did not, if they refused to submit to these people. We cannot submit for a moment to false teaching. Jude 22 through 23 gives us another uh, picture of what our responsibility is towards such people. Because it's not just, it's to not submit, but also it looks a little bit more detailed than that. 
we're to snatch them out as out of fire. Have mercy on those who doubt. There are some who believe false teaching. They follow blindly like sheep. Have, uh, th that's a whole different breed. There are some who doubt, who doubt the truth and the true doctrines of Christ. Have mercy on them, Jude says. Verse 23, save others by snatching them out of the fire. Have you ever dropped a marshmallow in the fire, right? I'm, I'm hoping you just left it, but let's just pretend that that thing was so valuable to you, right? How are you going to try to get that thing out of there? Are you going to try, oh, ah, 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 let me try to get that out of there. No, it's going to melt. It'll be gone in a second, and you'll lose it, right? Or if you, if you let's say you, you drop your social security card, right? On the, that's a better example than marshmallow. Or, the, or your marriage certificate, okay? And, and you drop it on there. Are you going to try to, oh, let me try to, uh, without, I don't want to burn myself, right? No, you're going to snatch it out quick, right? Have you ever put your, your finger over a candle fire, right? You can, you can just do it real quick. You, you won't get burned. At least a little uh, black mark on your finger, but. Um, <clears throat> so you've got to snatch them out quick. You have to take initiative fast, and you have to do it quick or you will get burned. And then it says, to others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh, lest the pollution spread to you. Be careful of false teaching. Snatch them out if you can. Have mercy on others. So that's a kind of terror that we see in the kingdom of heaven. But there's also those who persist in practicing lawlessness, rebellion against God's holy law. They continue in a lifestyle of sin. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 6. He's talking about those who will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Verse 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. We're talking about the kingdom of heaven here. Who are those who will not inherit? The unrighteous. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, that's fraudsters, right? Swindlers, we don't usually say that will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You must repent from a lifestyle of sin. This isn't talking about one-off sin, right? A stumbling, a falling, once or here or there. We're talking about unrepentant lifestyle of sin. Are you tracking with me? That's what he's talking about here. So that is a kind of person that will be a tear, someone who persists in lawlessness. These are people who might be deceived by their evil hearts. As the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 3, 13, he says, or 12 and 13, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. It's possible that that same heart is in us. Hebrews 12 also talks about Esau, right? A man who traded his birthright for what? For sexual immorality and unholiness. That's what the scripture says. In Hebrews 12, sexual immorality and unholiness. Now, we don't usually call exchanging your birthright for a bowl of soup sexual immorality, do we? But that's what the author calls it here. Because the Spirit of God yearns jealously over the Spirit He's put in us, over this body He's intended for His use. And it's adultery when we go after anything else. Sexual immorality against the Lord and his covenants. The covenant we made with Christ. That's Hebrews 12 if you want to see it. Uh, verses 14 through 17. So, <clears throat> what is our responsibility in this? Well, 
you can kind of see it in the in this passage in Hebrews 3 where it says in the next verse verse 13 but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin sin is deceitful it wants to convince us that chasing it would be more pleasing when truly at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. And so what do we, what must we, what must we do? Exhort one another every day, admonish, rebuke each other, share truth with each other. Do you do that? Do you share truth with each other? Is that all on your lips, that grace of speaking the truth to each other? To preserve each other. That's what we have in mind, in sight. I want to preserve my wife, Jenna, so I'm going to speak truth to her today. She wants to preserve me, so she's going to speak truth to me today. She's not going to let me persist in my whiny, you know, my whiny time, right? My self-pity time. She does that. Literally, one time she, like, threw me against the wall. That's, that's Jenna for you. She's strong. Threw me against the wall. She, I forget what she said, but it was good. <laughs> I said, whoa. Anyway, so, <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> so, um, that's part of our, re- our responsibility is exhortation and rebuke. It's, it's to confront. It's confrontation. Confrontation in our culture is awkward. We don't like it. We don't like to be confronted. We don't like to confront others. We like to just let things slide over, and then it explodes in this random argument and fight you have with your wife when you're right, you know it. But you could have averted that whole thing if you had just actually talked about it and confronted it in the first place, right? So we're called a, con- a, a culture of confrontation. It's going to be a little messy, right? We're going to make mistakes we're going to accidentally confront someone on something we shouldn't have. We're going to feel hurt at first, and we're going to have to go to our corner and cry. Oh, they don't think I'm good. You're not. You're evil. <laughs> okay? No, you're not. You're righteous in Christ. But you may have an unbelieving evil heart. So be open to confrontation and exhortation. So <clears throat> that's what, that's uh, in Matthew 18, five chapters after the one we're reading, Jesus gives a process for how to confront brothers in sin. Matthew 18, 15 through 17. He says this, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Confront the problem. Between you and him alone first, just the two of you, talk it out. Don't bring in other people. Don't gossip about them. Don't slander them. That's oftentimes what we do. We'd rather deal with it by talking to someone else about it than dealing with them head on. Come on, I know that some people can relate to that because I have a lot of you talking to me about other people's problems, okay? <laughs> All right? So, <clears throat> and it says this promise, if you... If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, here's the next step. Take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. This is kind of a judicial process, right? They didn't listen to me, so I'm just going to talk bad about them. No, confront them with somebody else so that they can actually establish that your charge is actually true, first of all and that they are actually responding right or wrong. And then, <clears throat> and honestly, if, if I'm honest with you, as I practice this, usually I get through the first step, and either the person repents, or the person gets angry and leaves the church. So I, I hardly ever get to the second step. <laughs> but you may have that. You may have that. Someone who persists in sin. If he refuses to listen to them, here's the next step. Tell it to the church. Then the church has to talk with them. The elders. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, the next step, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Don't even associate with that person. So that's part of our responsibility. It's confrontation, but that can oftentimes lead to excommunication. 
This is something a, a lot of people don't like to talk about. And part of the reason why they don't like to talk about it is because we have seen so many churches do it wrong. Am I right? We see, we've seen churches that the first thing that they go to is excommunication, is discipline. And sometimes we forget that the Lord disciplines those who he loves. Hebrews 12. The Lord disciplines those who he loves. And so we discipline out of a heart of love with a view in mind of this person's sanctification, their holiness, and ultimately their salvation. This was the heart of Paul in 1 Corinthians 5. You see this picture of Paul confronting someone caught in sexual immorality. He was having sex with his stepmom. Awkward. So he confronts the issue. Now nobody in the church wanted to confront the issue. And so he has to write a letter to them about it. They, they just let it sit. So he says to them, let him who has done this be removed from among you. Verse 3, for though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such, th such a thing. Judgment. And here's the judgment. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his, his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Isn't that interesting? The excommunication was not just social. It was an excommunication from the church, from the protection of God's kingdom, the protection of the covenants and of the grace that is in the church, delivered back into the very hands of of Satan. Now, Satan, outside of the sheep pen, this person is subject to Satan's attacks. And Satan comes after them hard, apparently, because he calls it the destruction of their flesh. Did you know that? That's what true excommunication does. It's a spiritual thing. It's a hard thing. What a harsh thing to do. But it's not without love because it's for the purpose of the salvation of their soul. That's what Paul says, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. It's so important that we repent of sin, that even this harsh discipline is sometimes necessary. But excommunication is also social. It's a disfellowshipping. Sometimes we forget this part, Sometimes a church, the elders will excommunicate someone, but the congregants will continue to eat with this person, to drink coffee with this person, to have them over. Did you know that that is not true excommunication? That's why Paul, he says to these people, I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of, and he lists these particular sins, sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, swindler. Does that sound familiar? That's the next chapter, 1 Corinthians 6. We read it earlier. Not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? I have nothing to do with judging outsiders. The sexually immoral of this world, the drunkards of this world, the fraudsters of this world. God judges them is what it says. Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside, but you purge the evil person from among you. Do you believe that, church? Not too many people are excited to believe that one, but you must. This is the word of the Lord, and we're grateful for it. So this is a, a harsh dis, dis, this disfellowshipping. It's with a long process. It takes time to get there. Sometimes you don't even get there through the process. I'm, I'm glad to say that we haven't even had to get to that point. Um, <clears throat> maybe we need to change up what we're doing to, to get to that point. I don't know. <laughs> I'll talk about it with the elders later. But, um, <clears throat> but yeah, this is for the purpose of, of cleansing out the leaven of sin. Paul says in that same passage, he, he compares 
this sin that is allowed to persist in the body of Christ as the leaven of malice and evil. That's in verses 6 through 8. It's leaven. Remember, leaven, the kingdom of God is like leaven. It spreads and spreads, but so is sin. And if you introduce it into the body, the bread of the church, it will spread. It is not just an individual choice to persist in sin. It affects the whole body. And so we must take initiative. We must confront sin. We must rebuke. We must discipline. And here's the real, one of the big things that caught my, um, my attention about this. Here's what we're missing out on if we don't keep ourselves pure, if we don't pur purify our hearts, cleanse our hands, and make sure that our church is clean, we're missing out on revival. We're missing out on a ministry of holiness to the Lord. Who will ascend the holy hill? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Your sin, Isaiah 59, one through two, like we're missing out on revival because we know that the Lord's hand is not so short that he cannot deliver. We know that he is powerful to come to this place and actually genuinely save thousands of people even here in the rocky soil of Vermont. That's how powerful our God is. His hand is not so short that he cannot deliver, but sin makes a separation between us and our God. Isaiah 59 one through two, behold the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Do you believe that, church? Do you believe it, church? I literally just read a scripture. I hope you can say you believe it. That can create a separation for us. How can we have this priesthood interceding on behalf of Vermont for salvation, for revival, if we allow sin to continue? It will create a division between us and our God. That's motivation for me. That's motivation to repent, to pray the prayer of David, Lord, search my heart, know what is in me, test me, if there's anything unpleasing to you and cleanse me of it so that I can be a priest useful for you an intercessor on behalf of Vermont of our country now <clears throat> I'm out of time <laughs> but I, I want to say this last thing that you know I, those are all different kinds of tears but there's another this is really I think what Jesus is getting at with these tears what he's really getting at is not just somebody who's conspicuous in their false teaching, what they believe or what they do, their sinful lifestyle. He's talking about someone who is unfruitful, someone who is not bearing fruit. That's the difference between a tear and wheat. One produces fruit of poison. The other produces true fruit, fruit that is pleasing to God. The difference is our fruit. Now, it's a seed. There, there's a root there in Christ. It's only possible by the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. We do not will it ourselves. We cannot do it, amen? There is literally no way that you're going to strain out an apple out of your head. You're not going to strain out fruit unless the Holy Spirit and the miraculous work of God is upon you to produce fruit. Did you know that? You literally can't will it. That's called will worship. It's called self-made religion. That is a false gospel. You cannot produce fruit out of your own will, out of your own flesh. That is to worship yourself and what you can do. And so we get on our knees and we cry out, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Empower me to produce fruit. Because this is the difference between a tear and wheat. So Lord, produce in me possess me, take control of me, and bear fruit, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, right? Galatians 6, love, joy, peace, patience, faithfulness. I can't say the others, if I'm honest. Somebody, I know all of you else can, know, but um, <clears throat> I hear you all mut muttering it, yeah. <laughs> I knew that would happen. So <clears throat> that, that, is, um, that is what I, God, the Lord is asking us to, 
to do. That's what true sons of the kingdom will do is bear fruit. Matthew 24 through 25, speaking of the end of the age, Jesus makes this even more clear with the parables of the virgins, the ten virgins. He makes it clear with the other uh, two parables, which off the top of my head I'm forgetting. Um, <clears throat> The virgins, the talents, and the sheep and the goats. What is the difference between the virgins who were ready and the ones who were not? Well, readiness. Literally, readiness. Were they ready? No, they weren't. They were not filled with oil. They did not have an anointing of oil upon them. They weren't ready for the Lord to come. The talents. One was given a talent, and what did he do? Instead of investing it, to multiply it, what God had given him. He buried it. And it's crazy, his reason, he says, I was afraid. Luke 19, he says, I was afraid of you knowing that you are a harsh man and you bear fruit where you have not sown. What the heck does that even mean? I bear fruit where I haven't sown, says Jesus? What are you talking about? I'm sowing seeds to bear fruit. Like, st stop having this theology that I'm going to bear fruit apart from you actually obeying me. Okay? That's why I planted you. I'm not reaping where I, hadn't, where I haven't sown. I reap where I sow. So, <clears throat> he was afraid. This is what that person does. He's afraid, and so he cannot bear fruit. The final judgment was the difference between the sheep and the goats. The goats who will go to eternal hellfire are those, the difference between them is what they did and did not do. The difference was the fruit of love. So this is not a gospel of works. This is a gospel of faith that produces works. Faith in the Holy Spirit that produces works. And it must produce works because a faith without works is dead. According to the apostle, not the apostle, he's the brother of Jesus, James. I don't even need to flip there. Faith without works is dead. As the body without works, or without um, a soul, without a spirit, is dead, so is faith without works. You may have the body of faith, but it's in its grave, unless works invigorate that body. And so we must bear fruit, righteous deeds of the glory of God. Do you believe that, church? That we must bear fruit? And it's only possible by the Holy Spirit. And so this is calling us to great reliance on him. One more passage. I'm, I'm ending. Don't worry. <laughs> but one more passage of fruitfulness that we're being called to. 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11. For this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and that's also moral excellence. And virtue with knowledge. And knowledge with self-control. And self-control with steadfastness. And steadfastness with godliness. And godliness with brotherly affection. And brotherly affection with love. Why? For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. They keep you from being unfruitful. I want to be effective for the Lord. I want to bear fruit. Does anybody else here want to bear fruit for the Lord and be effective for Him? So that's our prayer today. Here we are at the end of the age the Lord will come. Will we be ready for him when he sends his angels to gather up the frauds to send them to hell for eternity? Will we be ready? Will we have fruit that proves our faith? Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you. Lord, we come to you desperate. We want fruit. Lord, we want to be counted among those who are the true sons of the kingdom. So, Lord, 
Let your spirit be upon us right now in the name of Jesus. Oh, Lord, let there be fruit in this church. Let us be seeds sown into the earth who bear in our bodies the death of Christ, who bear much fruit. Lord, take out everything in us that would keep us from fruitfulness. Lord, there are people here who right now, they are not wheat. Take them for yourself now in the power of your Holy Spirit. I pronounce the authority and power of Jesus Christ over this place. Let every dark spiritual authority fall, tremble before your power in the name of Jesus. Take us for yourself, Lord. Cleanse us. Let us be useful for you and your work. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Now we're going to take communion. This is...